I think we have a fairly full room right now. I'm getting more handouts made. I forgot to take into account the, the, our staff members that joined us as well. Uh, just as a quick welcome, this is the second in uh, four assessment workshops that the EDC is putting on. Last week, um, my colleague Mary Stella talked about why assess people. And today we're going to talk about how to assess. So talk about some of the tools that uh, Carlton has available some of the tools that we can put into place for your online assessment strategies, or actually, I should have said in class too, because we have some face-to-face uh, -face options as well. So, just for what we're going to talk about today, I'll have a, just a quick icebreaker. Let people sort of talk about some of their own experiences. I'll go into some of the tools in general that are out there, and then maybe more specifically what assessment tools are available in Carleton. And then I'll go into, I'll show you some actual examples from CU Learn, from CU Portfolio, and some things that we have out there that are available. And then uh, before we go, I'm going to talk about some ideas of how to choose, how to decide what the best tool for your class is, for your needs are. So I know there's a lot of things out there. You should and some people just say, ooh, this is shiny, I want to try this. But there, if you follow maybe a bit of a model, there's a good way to find the best tool that may, is effective for you. So just to move in here, uh, I want to talk about how you can uh, distinguish between some of the tools, uh, concerns regarding implementing these tools into your class, so maybe if you have concerns about some, some ideas, and then just outline how to choose the technology. So obviously, in one hour, we're not going to have a lot, get into a lot of depth about it. But if I can at least introduce you some of the ideas, then I think we'll be off to a good start. So uh, as a quick icebreaker, uh, I always like to use this at, some, at the beginning of these tools. I call it miscommunication. But uh, what I want to talk about is just because everybody has experience, good and bad, using technology. Uh, for assessment for your courses. So I just want maybe, it doesn't have to be groups of three, maybe just with your tables, partners, whoever's there with you. I want you to think about some maybe embarrassing or frustrating experience that you've had maybe, uh, with assessment. So for example, just as me, uh, in my own experience as a student, I actually submitted the completely wrong uh, assignment. I just went into my assignment, grabbed one thing, it was a completely wrong thing, and Thankfully, my instructor said, um, you know, you're supposed to be handing in assignment three, not two. So uh, it worked out for me. But I think if you guys just take maybe a couple of minutes, three or four minutes, and talk with the people at your table, just some experience that you've had where technology didn't work for you when you're trying to do something, either as a student or as an instructor. So, so, so. <laughs> Technology. Oh, okay. Thank you, Richard. Okay. <laughs> I saw Ali, did you? Yeah, I was just going to say, as a student, I'm sure every one of you have had a student who did this. When I was an undergrad, I went online to submit into a course management system um, to submit an assignment attached or uploaded the assignment to a Word file, thought I was done, went away, and then, you know, weeks later, I got my mark back, which was a big old goose egg, and that was because I had not pressed the submit button. <laughs> Uh, I hear about that one a lot. <laughs> Ian? Uh, I had two things that are related to the same problem. One was I set up some quizzes, and I took the time to make sure that the start and end dates were correct. Another instance, I uploaded all these grades, but I didn't realize that neither one of them were visible to the students, and still hitting weeks later. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Here you go. Actually, I, I actually helped an instructor with something like that this morning, so you're not alone. <laughs> Anybody else? The same thing happened to me with the visible and hidden. Okay. And I always have to double check and to remember to make it like not visible for students because it, it, how I got to know, I, sub, I posted a lab for students to complete it on a Thursday. And when I get into the lab, uh, the actual lab, they have submitted already. Hmm. And I, I was thinking, how come? I didn't put it like to hide it. Uh. So it was visible for two days and I was not aware. Uh, so you, before it. They got to submit it before you even had a chance to go over anything. So, yeah. I wanted them to do it in class and then to, to ask of course. questions. Yeah. They have done it. Yeah. They help the bullet, so. There you go. <laughs> I learned that it's sometimes not advisable to go for the option to have the EDC upload the grades. I did a Scantron. Two-thirds of the students failed. It was 30% of the final, and did I get help from them mm. until I got the exams 
graded them manually, and changed all the grades. Okay. There you go. <laughs> yeah. My favorite one that I've ever had was when, um, according to the Scantrons, because I had a cross-listed course, it told me I had 292 errors of Scantrons because it wouldn't recognize both sections of the course. It would only recognize one. You could only upload or score one. And the one that had the smaller number of students in it, not the larger. And yeah, that was that was a fun nightmare um, because it was overloading the memory. It would scan the last line of every page on every oh. single Oh, Scantron. <laughs> Two weeks later, they figured out what it was and fixed it before the next midterm and the next final. But it was fun. Good. Class of 500, it was painful. I can understand, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else or? No? Nope. Yeah, she will. A, a quick one. Uh, last term, I chose midnight of the second day uh. to be the date. <laughs> and uh, that brought me in such a big hole. Mm. Uh, because no matter how I said it, somebody would misinterpret that to be that day or this day. Mm -hmm. So this year I'm going with 8, 8 p.m. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice safe number there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Submission of uh, assignments by midnight. Yes. Or noon is a big problem. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The 12, they think it's it's not noon, they think it's midnight, and uh, they think that a.m. is yeah. noon, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's not, it's midnight. That, that, so yeah, I was setting my my uh, deadline at 23.55, yeah. which yeah. could not be mistaken. Yeah. That's usually what we recommend here is the 23.55 or something that's very evident so that there's no confusion. So, um, but. This is a good example of why you have need to have clear instructions. So, <laughs> um, okay, well that's that's a lot. So I think we've touched a lot on the assignments and the assessments. So just moving on, I just want to talk about the secret. So we want to make it easy. It needs to align with your goal and your purpose of what you're trying to do. It needs to be integrated with your course and what you lines up with what you're working on. And then finally, model or participate. So by model or participate, you want to be, make it very evident to them what they need to do. That's like where the clear instructions lay it out explicitly of what they need to do. Because, as we've talked about, there's always some kind of confusion. There's always some kind of, hey, yeah. There's always some kind of thing that, like the midnight, like those kinds of things. So that's, that's where you need to very, be very explicit and make sure that it's laid out for the students. So this is your secret. Don't forget, OK? There's going to be a test later. All right. Um, so just some examples, just quickly. Uh, what are some assessment tools that we have here? Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are very aware of these. So we have See You Learn. We've got assignments, quizzes. Um, there's lessons. You can grade in forums. You can grade in a number of different things. Uh, I'll get into that in a little bit more detail later. CU Portfolio, uh, which is uh, Ali, I'll get into that more detail. Also, like, so online publishing, if you want to do blogs, uh, talking about uh, reflection, that kind of thing. Online communications, so how uh, will you be interacting with the students? Maybe discussion forums, having, uh, like using Big Blue Button as a virtual classroom, some kind of chats, getting some real-time real talk or, uh, going on. Some kind of collaborative working. So outside of the uh, the the C Learn realm, Google Docs is a really good tool. We don't officially support that, but I, I think it's a good thing. Wikis, workshops. We've also have a, a 3D environment that some instructors are using for students to be able to go in and actively participate. Actually, uh, one instructor just came in, Joanna, so she's actually going to be working in some of that. So these are just some potential online tools that we have that are readily available. Some devices, software tools that are out there. So as some of you talked about painfully, uh, we have Scantron or scanning that is very common. A lot of people are using that for their exams, for um, quick grading, multiple choice, et cetera. Um, using some mobile computings, if most students now have a cell phone or a tablet, there's ways that we can use that for interaction to talk about um, 
uh, sort of sometimes retention questions if you're using a lecture in your classroom. Students can either use a cell phone or actually further down here, we clickers. Uh, if they have clickers, you can ask some questions throughout the lecture so the students are actually make sure that they're paying attention or know that know that you can move on or not have to review a topic, so that's good. There are smart boards on campus. Um, what about laptops and devices? How could you possibly use those in your classes? It's, if you want students to bring that, how do you view it? Is it engagement, actually assessing a formative, uh, formative assessment, or is, do you find it a distraction? So how do you look at that? So there's some, some ways to deal with that. And then finally, you need to think about accessibility. How can you deal with maybe PMC students or students that need special uh, considerations when dealing with that? Uh, and there are ways to deal with that on uh, CU Learn and other tools. So if you do have questions, please let us know. We can help you with that. So those are some of the main things we have. Uh, more specifically within CU Learn, I'm going to pop over into CU Learn. I've created a, a sample of what it be, what it could be. There's quizzes. Lots of different question types in quizzes. Um, uh, I'm sure some of you have used them already. Um, assignments, you can do group or individual assignments. Uh, online text, file submission, there's a number of different varieties, ways that you can grade or rubrics or just simple grading. Or, um, you can also have lessons that students navigate themselves with uh, retention questions built right into them so that they can check and control their pathway. And um, I'm just putting this one in testing. We have some workshops that uh, it's a kind of a peer review type of tool. Um, it's still kind of playing around. I have an example that I built, but it's not fully developed. We're still, so if there's anybody willing to test it out, let me know. Um, I'm just going to go into CU Learn, uh, show you some built examples of some of these CU Learn tools. Let's pop in here. Go. So we have a course that we call the CU Learn Gallery. Uh, some of you, I believe, are actually already enrolled in this, but if you would like to be able to come in here and look at some built-up examples, then uh, feel free. Actually, Peter, I think some of your actual course material is there. So, <laughs> um, so just scrolling down. So I just want to look at these assessment tools first of all. So I've built a few different examples of assessment tools that are available. So the first one is an assignment, just a regular file upload assignment, but I built in a rubric with it. So just so that you can see what a rubric look, might look like from a student perspective. So. Okay. so this is just a grading summary page that you're looking at right now. Okay, actually I want to it's about divided it by groups. So I have the student was really late, a year and 363 days late submitting, but they got it in. Now that's the important part. So you can see that here's the file submission, and there's all the information for the student here. But if I want to be able to grade with a rubric, I'll come under the grade icon right here. If you can't see past me, I'll just try and move here. Um, just going to click on this little pencil icon for EDC student one. So you can see, I set up a basic rubric, and so you can see that there's several different levels. These, you can define these however you'd like. You don't have to be bound by the 0, 1, 2, 3. You can set it whatever you like. Unfortunately, you can't put like a, a 0 to 5, because it needs an absolute number whenever you're creating, whenever you're setting it up. So if I'm looking, so this EDC student one, uh, they did very good. So I'll click very good. This automatically will add up into your rubric as you're finishing. So, so say very good. Oh, good job on your intro. And so I can add for each different criterion within the rubric, I can add that. So good job on your intro. Moving through, obviously, I just go quickly, body of the essay, of course. Uh, fractional points? Uh, like zero point. Um, yes, you can. Yeah, you can. Okay, all right. Thank you. But the overall total has to be out of a full number. It can't be a half part mark yeah. for the overall total. So whatever, if you have any, <laughs> I screwed myself on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, it, it'll throw everything way off. So you want your overall total to be a whole number, but you can use half marks or quarter marks or whatever else throughout, as long as your overall total gets to a full number. Okay. So okay. Just, otherwise, it shows up in the grade book only as a full number. So it'll. Wonky it up for you, otherwise, for 
And another thing I want to point out about this, you need to have a zero point because it measures a range. So whenever it's adding up, so if you click and say it says two, it needs to know, it knows that, okay, your range is from zero to three. But say, for example, you have your range, oh, well, the, the lowest one's a five and the top's a 15. It actually measures that range of 10 because the difference between five and 15 is 10. So you need to have a zero. Even if you don't want to give a score of zero, you need to put the zero just as that way to measure the range for the students. So, okay. And then here's just another one here. I, I, I didn't understand that. Uh, you were saying, I need to uh, set up a fictitious student and give that student a... No, 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 no. Just uh, see how I have a zero for every single one of these is there's a zero. When you're creating your criterion, you need to have a zero and the high. So it can measure the low to the high. So it knows what the range, the total range is within that. So, so each of those criteria should be, should have zero to... Zero, yeah. So like here I have zero, one, two, three, but you can say zero, five, ten, fifteen or whatever you want with that, but it needs to have that low point of zero so that it will measure for you, okay? Um, and then, so that's, that's it for um, a rubric. And then you can add any specific comments for the whole assignment, feedback files. Now this is actually a new feature since we upgraded. You can choose to notify the student immediately or not. So you can change this. So I don't want to notify the student. We need to work with that, but so, no, no email gets sent to the student, or you can say yes, an email will get the sent to the student. Your assignment has been graded, so, okay. One heads up if you're gonna do that, though, is that if you don't have it visible, if you haven't released the grades and made it visible in the grade book, they've received the email. The system says you've graded it, I can't see it, and it's been 30 seconds since you hit the button. <laughs> and you're gonna get that from every single student for every single assignment, so you might want to default that to know, and then when you decide to show everything, then send an email to everyone saying you have it. Yeah. It's a, a little bit nicer. Yeah, it's a little bit straight, more straightforward to get through. For every time that button used to be defaulted at yes, but now you can change it to no. Mm -hmm. so up. Okay, so I'll just click the save the changes, and then so grade saves changed, and you'll see be able to go in and then see what the grade was. So. Uh, Where's the grade over here? It adds up for this. Maybe I didn't set it in the grade actual assignment itself, so I have to set that up, but it, trust me, it works. It does add up. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go into the settings. I think I didn't turn uh, that on, but so, so you can see it keeps track of the assignments itself, so. Okay, so. Um, then, uh, how does the group assignment work? I'll get into that in a minute. Actually, that's one of the examples that I'll be showing you, so I'll get to that in a second. So, so that's uh, just a basic file upload for a student, and uh, you can see that you can put in a rubric. Uh, very straightforward, it's, but it, as you can see, it's just a click, click, click. It makes things very simple for you if you're grading. So. Okay, uh, next, uh, there's another way to grade. Uh, there's, it's, I just have another example. Online text, just a student entering directly into the CU Learn system as opposed to uploading a file. And with this one, I added what's called a marking guide. So, marking guide is very similar to uh, a rubric. It's just, uh, I'll show you in a second what it looks like here. So, we'll go in, just same place in the grade. So you can see, I just copied and pasted some file that I had. Uh, I put it into the online text. So this is where you would see the student submission. And then if you go down here, this is how you're grading with a marking guide. It's just a more general band. Instead of being, whereas in the rubric, it's very granular. So zero, this is my comment for zero. One, my comment for one. This is just a general thing. This is your introduction. And then you can enter comments in general and then enter a score in general. So you can add a lot more. And also for students, I'm, not, I'm logged in as an instructor, so I can see both of these points right here. The students would only see this is where you'll be marked on your introduction or whatever comment that you have so that students know. And then whoever's marking, if you have a lot of TAs, they will see the second part. 
And so there's instructions that you can send directly to the marker for the TAs, for example. So, and then you can do this. You can also create frequently used comments. So if you have comments that you just regularly use, you can go and set them all up, and then you can select, and it automatically will go into each part here. So I didn't actually set that part up in advance. So. Okay. Can TAs create frequently used comments? Um, I don't think so, because this is uh, it's the setup that's done by the instructor has to set up this, so I don't think TAs will be able to go ahead and do anything like that. So, you guys know? No, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't think so. TAs don't have any kind of editing privileges. So, yeah. and then the same thing here. So you can add your comments or anything like that. So those are two different ways that we're for grading that are built within the assignment tool that I think that are, uh, I think they're very, very useful ways to do that. And I'm not sure, Ryan, if you're going to talk a little bit more in detail about them next week. So uh, next week in our next edition, uh, Ryan's going to be talking about feedback and in more detail like that. So. And uh, for the offline activity, I won't go into detail on that. Offline, it, you can create an assignment where you can grade for, without having requiring students to submit anything. Say it's a presentation, you just want to be able to grade in there, you can create something like that. Just when you're in your settings, don't turn on any file or online submission. You're just creating a shell, basically. So it, it puts something into your grade book. But the last one I know is group assignment. I know uh, a number of people, actually, I saw some comments asking how to do team assessment or group assessment, how people can work together on different pr projects. So what I've done here is I created a group assignment and I already submitted as if I was part of the group just to show you. So, so you can see I only have one real group here. But. So I, I logged in actually as one of these students and I uploaded one assignment and automatically that gets pushed to everybody else in the group. So if I've turned on group, uh, group assignments, so only one person, you can choose if you want everybody to submit or one person. Most people just want one person to do it. And then it automatically goes to everybody else. And when you're grading, very similar to how you notify the student. So whenever you're grading, at the bottom, apply grades and feedback to entire group. And so that will push everything out to the rest of the class. One thing that is really important if you're going to be using group assignments, make sure everybody in the class is a member of a group. If there is somebody who is not in a group, by default, their group is considered the class. So if that one person submits for, uh, they would tech, before everybody else, they would be submitting for the whole class. So, and that would override what the, the people that they're doing in their group. So what I recommend, there's a couple ways to do it. Either you can create for that one person who says, I want to do it by myself, I don't like working with people, create a group of one. Or what you can do is create what's called a grouping. And a grouping is a group of groups. So take all of the groups that you know are working on this assignment and put them into this one large group. And so then whenever you're setting up the assignment, you say only choose people from grouping A, for example. And then anybody who's not been put into one of those groups is actually excluded from that assignment. So they have to be put into a group. So that's fair warning, OK? <laughs> uh, sorry? Yes? Um, in the previous uh, screen, you showed when one student submits, yep. it goes for all students in that group. Yes. Um, I have had situations where uh, in a group there may have been debates. Uh, I don't like your thing. Mm -hmm. I, I have added something more last night. So after a student has uh, uploaded something, another student of the same group has uploaded his version okay. and wrote to me saying, please read mine, etc. How does that work with you? What you can do is there's a setting whenever you're creating it that, uh, so what I said here is I selected one group member only to submit. You can choose everybody has to submit. There's an option where you thought either one person or everybody. But if you have it turned on to everybody and somebody else, they would have to contact you directly because it's the first person that uploads that goes to their group. So, yeah. Okay. 
Um, something else I've seen another instructor do in that kind of situation was they allowed two or three file submissions, so rather than just one. So then multiple files can be attached, but then it still attaches to everybody. So, yeah. so, so it's, two files will go for it in everybody's box? Yeah, so I would say it's better to keep it at one and then let that single person contact you directly. So. Okay. Any other comments about groups, using group assignments, group submissions? Okay, um, it's, it's pretty clear, I think, whenever you're doing it, so you can see uh, what group they're in, and if you've turned it on, you can filter by the different groups so that you can make sure that everything goes to the right people or you can find which groups haven't submitted, because if it's, if, for example, if I just go to look at the whole list, you'd be flipping through, and it's like, okay, where's the members of this group, where am I going, I don't know, so try and, you can always just filter. So by separate groups up here, so that it's easier to keep track of different group members, for example. Okay. All right. So those are the main types of uh, assignments that we can do in CU Learn. Is there any other questions? I'm going to before I move on to anything else. This, those are just examples there. So. No. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. I didn't. Say. It's just a formal question. I've, I've used this, but uh, I've tried to see the whole thing on one screen, and that's impossible. Can you help? Um, not really. Uh, you mean to like drag across to see everything? It's that's just the number of fields that are there, I, I'm, and not really a way, a simple way to do that. I don't think is there. No, nothing that I know of. So um, it's just that's the number of things that are available. So you'd have to scroll across your screen to see the other items. So. But in order to uh, scroll across, you have to go down. Not anymore. No, no. Has that been? That's been fixed. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, I just want to show you now, just uh, have a sample quiz here, um, just a brief little. So what students go see, just basic quiz, self-study quiz. So you can see got multiple choice, uh, true, false. Uh, actually, I think I only have a couple different types here, but there's numeric value. You can have essay questions. There's a lot of different question types. Um, or I'm not sure if there's um, the calculated multiple choice. Yeah, I can't think off the top of my head, but there's hmm? matching. There, there's matching. There's um, I think there's about ten or yeah, simple calculator. There's about ten or twelve different question types that you can put in. Uh, feel free to go in and explore. Um, but once the student does the quiz, so you can just go in, just choose your answer. There's a lot of options. A lot of the questions I get about doing quizzes are about plagiarism and like randomization, things like that. There are a number of different things you can do to put in. You can shuffle all of the question orders so people can't be looking over somebody's shoulder. Uh, you can randomize the questions that are selected from a question bank. So for example, it's a, a 10 question quiz, but you have 50 questions. So you can say, randomly choose 10 questions from this category so that not everybody will be getting the same questions. Um, there's also, there is a pop-up. So it'll pop up into a full screen so that you can't go to another window. For example, so right now, if I have two windows open when I started this, I can go and check another browser window. If you have it open up in a pop-up, they wouldn't be able to easily do that. Still, there's, there's always ways you can go and check something else. Like, oh, yeah. yeah so it's easy. There's, yeah, sorry. Oh, I thought, I thought I heard somebody say something. Um, there's no 100% fail proof way that you can stop cheating. There are ways that we can kind of prevent this automatically if I open up another browser window. If I open up a new browser window for students, it will. Uh, provide, say, a shutdown the attempt, saying, oh, that's a cheating attempt. So if you do get that and somebody says, oh, well, my student said it shut down, usually it's because they opened up another browser window while doing the quiz. Uh, there's still ways that they can get around it, obviously. Down at the bottom, they can go and click on other things. So just, just so you know that whenever you're designing your questions, try to think about ways that you can, it's not going to be easy 
to cheat. So they can they, they need to spend all the time that they have available to them to answer within the 10 minutes or 20 minutes or however long that you give. So, has anybody had experiences with quizzes where like, some problems or some uh, maybe you think students might have cheated or tried to do something? Has anybody actually used them? Actually, let's put that on. Yeah. A few people. Yeah. Do you mean online? Yes. Yeah. I have a question about yeah. how to use them. Like, I want to incorporate learning activities or self-assessment like that, um, but I'm not sure. Like, should it be worth completion marks, or is it really about like, the answers and how, how to incorporate it into the whole? Like, it depends on what. What, what you want for it. So what is your goal for doing the quiz? So if it's just a self-study quiz, maybe, maybe just a completion, but if you actually want to test content, so if you want to be, uh, so you've done three modules and you want to see how well do you know that, you might want to give more weight to that. Uh, so it depends, but what's your overall assessment scheme? So if you have quizzes as a relatively minor thing, but you have larger assignments, it's, it's a balance. It's, so it's, it's kind of a difficult without knowing exactly what your, the goals for your course are with that. But I've seen instructors give uh, like 20% for quizzes that are like 100 question quizzes built within here for like their entire midterms and finals, so, or, or even more weight for that. So it's, it's what you make of it, I think. So. I, guess just, I want to encourage students to work with the material soon after it was mm -hmm. taught, but, so, yeah, I'm not sure. Would you be more it. considering like a formative type of assessment or, like, or just so as, they're, as they're going on, so would you be looking at sort of just to make sure that they've, they've got the material, not necessarily as like a, a final exam type right. of test, yeah. So there's ways, that we can do it just as quizzes, but you can also incorporate it. We have another tool called the lesson tool. I'll, I can touch on that in a little bit, where you can present material and then have questions built in after that. It's, it's not as good as the quiz in terms of the number of question possibilities that you have, but it's still, it would be able to, like what you're talking about, be able to allow the students to immediately check to make sure that, re that they've retained what they've actually watched. So if you have them watch or you go through some content, you can do that with that. So, if you... I have a good question. I've never done it either, but... Um... I would assume there is a timing. Yes. Yeah. There's a there's a timing. So you can set. There's two set two types of timing. So one is when the question is open. So maybe you allow students one week to do it. But from the time that they click enter, they can have another time. So one hour or two hours or however much long you wanted to to, to uh, allocate for that. Something that to be aware of, if you give them a longer time, like one week, to actually have it open, but then one hour in, make sure that, they're, uh, that you've checked to make sure that they can't go back in and review until it's closed for everybody. That's something that's happened to other instructors where they just left all the review options open. So students can come back in and look and say, oh, uh, question two is actually true. So they can they can tell that. So when you're setting it up, make sure that you've that you don't allow a review until after. So, yeah. so the, this could be used, for example, as a quiz. I do this um, as a quiz on the uh, reading. Like pre class, I usually send out um, a quiz like that. Okay. I give them twelve hours, and they have ten minutes to answer the quiz. Yeah. So this can be used as well? Exactly, yeah, it can be used exactly like that. So in advance, uh, you want them to do a pretest test before, before they come in, and then you can come in and you can see how well they did, if they did well. Okay, well, I don't... I don't, I don't mark it or anything. I just want them to make sure that they actually look at the reading. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah no, they can do that. <laughs> Good, yeah. So you can, you can set, and so once the class time comes, they're no longer able to go in and do that, so you just make sure that they've done that. So. Yeah. Yes. Uh, a couple of questions. So what is that? What is that flag question? Where? From the yeah, right. Uh, the flag. Yeah. Oh, what a flag is is it's for a student when they're doing it and they have some trouble or some question. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So they're not sure. The student can click on the flag and then they can come back. Uh, I I would see that student had an issue with that. Question. Uh, you, I don't think you'd see the individual students. So this is just this is just me doing a preview. But I, uh, you wouldn't be able to go go in and check the individual students' flags. I don't think so. No. 
So it is for the for the students use and benefit. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's just for them, so that then when, after they so say I click a flag here. So I want to. Uh, I see that flag on the number. Three. Yeah, there we go, right there. Yeah, so right there. So there's a little flag, so I can go back. If there's more quizzes, they're actually easier to see. But so. The other other question I have is how is, how difficult is this to set up? Do I have to enter each of the question and choices? Uh, I am I'm asking if I already have a test bank, can I kind of bring it in? Yeah, it's possible. Uh, it does say we need some. Uh, advance warning on that because it does take some time to get them to bring them all in but uh, de and depending on the number of questions as well so like uh, if you have 1500 questions it'll take more time than if you have 50 questions sometimes if, it, if you just have a small number of questions it's probably a little bit faster to just take them and copy and put them right into into so you learn but if you have a large number give us some more give us some notice in advance of, of what you're doing and then we can so you can do that from publishers uh, Anything else on quizzes or? Okay, um, so yeah, quizzes can be used a lot. So I'm just going to go back. So those are the main, the main formative types. I want to just quickly took, talk about uh, in forums. So I had some questions about how to talk about how to grade discussion forums and participation in that way. There's a few ways you can do it. So what I just did as an example in this one is you can provide a rating. And there's a number of different ways. You can just do a count where it, it adds up the number of posts that you've made. Or you can say, OK, well, like for example, I gave it a 2. This one's a 2. That means, oh, you did a good job. Obviously, a sadifa is not a very good one. But uh, so you can just say, oh, that's, that's a 0. You didn't actually contribute to this discussion. You just randomly posted. Uh, if you just said 1, oh, I agree. I think you did a good job. That's, again, that's not really contributing to what they're offering. Uh, but if they say, yeah, I agree, but why don't you think about da 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 da, then that's where you would give maybe a little bit more full grades on that. So that's, that's one option. You can provide a rating within that. So uh, you can also just have an instructor go in, and you can, uh, you can track the logs and have the TA go and count, go and track, see, OK, how many people actually looked at this, or how many people were actually working on that. I know some instructors that get extremely complicated in how they do it and how they're, OK, well, it's based on the number of replies that they received. And don't, don't make it needlessly complicated. As the easier it is for you, for your TAs, and for your students to understand, the better. So usually I tell people, just give a basic, OK, did they do it or not? That's it for this type of thing. And how well did they do? So, okay. There's another way that you can do. Um, that's in a discussion forum. We also have a, what's called a database type of thing. Um, I just want to show one example here, and this is one a course example that actually Mary Stella worked on. Um, this one course, and I know a number of other courses, they've created weekly, what they call weekly learning responses. So every week, based on the content, they have questions. So I'll just uh, look at the ad entry here. Every week, students are required to answer two things. So what are the key issues that were discussed today? And what's the most significant unanswered question? Just a very simple thing, doesn't need to be a lot, but it's, it's get some feedback on, OK, how effective was my lecture? What are we talking about? And it also gets them engaged in thinking about what they've learned and what they've talked about. So this is a good way to measure, to measure that uh, participation. Are they going in? Are they actually listening, being active in their class? Or are they just being passive? So are you, do you do anything like this, Peter, in your classes? Or no? Uh, not really. I have a discussion forum. Discussion yeah. forum. Not quite like this. This is um, Anne Trepanier's course that she's doing this. Uh, Mary Stella helped design. Are you, you're going to be doing a database session. Is that what you're planning? Oh, in the fall. OK. Sorry, I digress then. Um, so this is one example. So you can create a database if you want to have multiple entries the way that you're entering with this. Uh, I have another example that I can show you. This is one that I think this learning response I think this has been a very effective one. I've seen it work in a number of different courses. So I, just, I wanted to go to that one first. So. 
put another one here. So ask the instructor, what are your expectations from the course? Not necessarily really reflecting on the assessment for the theme of today, but um, you can go in and just say, okay, this is what I want to do. But it's just an example of all the fields you can add. So you can put different things. Actually, that's only one field, so it's not a good example. <laughs> But you can add a number of different things that people can contribute. They can contribute files, they can contribute images, they can contribute either in a text box or you can have a radio button so that they can just choose, select different things. So there's, there's a lot that you can do with this. It does require setup. Like it does take a little bit more setup than just a forum. So if you do want to do this, make sure that you're that you've tested it fully before you release it to your students because there are there are some hiccups that can possibly happen with it. So, okay. so that's uh, what we call the database tool. That's some examples there. Um, I have another tool here. It's not really fully developed, so I can't really get into it in too much detail. But the workshop is called um, it's it's a peer review type of tool. It's not released to the general public yet. We're just testing, but there's, uh, there were some questions about peer review and working with teams. So I just wanted to show you this. If you, do, if you are interested, please let us help you set it up. We need to, because it does, there's, as you can see, there's four different stages to this, to, to this assignment. So it does require a lot of coordination. So here we've got the submission phase. Uh, so you've done all your setup. I haven't done the full setup, but there's a submission phase. That's when students submit their work. And then what happens is after this has created a scheduled allocation, automatically student, the student assignments are distributed to other students. So you can have one student marking five other papers, for example, during this next phase called the assessment phase. And then at the end, grading evaluation phase, that's when you as the instructor would go back in and check to see how the students did. It's, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's the, that's the gist of it. I know, uh, Benjamin, you were, try, you were trying this with your class. Could you want to share some of your experience as a test? Yeah, um, so I did it without the, uh, without a grade component of it. So if you go through the whole process, you can set it up so that you just submit the work and then you can grade the content Also, the option to um, to grade the quality of the reviews that are given. Um, so, you know, I didn't use those those parts, but it's part of the sort of overall process. The only problem I ran into really was figuring out how to deal with students who uh, didn't turn things in by the time of the allocation, um, and figuring out how to match them up or do something because I, I had a class that was about like 400 students doing this. Mm. Once that, like, I didn't want to mess with the really allocation. That's great. Okay, thanks for sharing. Yeah, um, so it is something that we're testing out right now. It does require a lot to get going. So yeah, just just let you know that that's available. Um, so I've gone through a number of different things. Uh, it's I'm getting close to my one hour. I want to go into another thing that we have here, which is called CU Portfolio. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. Some may not. I'm not going to go into a lot because on May 28th, May 28th, there will be a special CU portfolio information session workshop for people to work on this. But I just wanted to show you just some examples. So look at these handsome devils right here. Look at that. Okay. Or beautiful, beautiful devils. Yes. <laughs> uh, so this is something that our department, we created. Uh, we just got together, just had a group description. And then each of us gave our own little reflection or our own about me type of activity. But this can be used for students to contribute. They can add their own coursework and show, uh, show progression over the le length of the course or throughout their university career. Uh, it's just a really good example for that. So this is just some examples of what our group looks like. See, I'm canoeing. Uh, and then Ali's in the, where were you on that? That's in the canal? Yeah, OK, great. So, yeah, this is just something that we put together, but this is um, without going in. Oh, I'm logged out. <laughs> um, sorry. 
So we have some other things for our different team members. So there's Mary Stella and the admin group. I actually, have, their pictures are my favorite. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so this is something that you can use for your students if you want them to be contributing to here for reflection pieces to show how what they've learned over time, depending on the assignments. But, but do you have anything to add to this, or what? What's your portfolio? Thank you. So uh, May 28th, May 28th, that's the CU portfolio session. Um, just quickly now, I've gotten, I lost a bit of my time here, so let's scroll through here. Um, I'll talk quickly about clickers. We also have clickers for in-class at clickersandpolleverywhere.com. Has anybody used either of these tools? You have, you have, you have, good. Good, bad, do you find it really contributes to your classes in terms of just formative assessment, keeping track of things, or? Handstand clickers love pull everywhere. Okay, fair enough. Do you care to elaborate, or? Um, I found clickers were hit and miss. I required students to, one, go and get themselves a clicker. Two, I have to count them to actually remember to get them a clicker. Um, and then also students that were hit and miss were able to get themselves a clicker. And happy when they show up to class. Um, and I just found that even with the stick going in and stuff, it was a bit hit and miss when I used it. Um, and people trying to sync it every time uh, they were using other classes, it just, yeah, it just, it was absolute hit and miss every single time. Pull everywhere. If you ask the students, did you remember to bring your cell phone to class? <laughs> you know, not an issue. They can use their cell, they can use the tablet, they can use their laptop, they yeah. can use whatever you want, I don't really care. Um, and it just solved all those issues that I was dealing with with the clickers. Um, I do have every once in a while some classrooms, the, the plug-in component not always working, mm -hmm. um, but um, I found that more of a minor annoyance. I can always log in on the website and get it all working every time. Yeah, I've heard that, that's something yeah, that's something that, I've, uh, that I have heard. One of the things is accessibility issues. We can tell students to get clickers, but we can't tell them to go out and get a cell phone or a tablet. So you need to make sure that your students all have a cell phone. I don't think they, not everybody has a cell phone these days, do they? No, no, no. no. Um, <laughs> um, but even that, like, I don't use it for grades. I use it um, more for checking where students are yeah. at and understanding everything else. And I also say work together, like come up with your answers, discuss them, and decide what you're going to be. And if the person besides you is answering differently, start arguing, because one of you is going to be wrong yep. as a minimum. So, mm -hmm. you know, and everyone starts really getting into the topics that way. That's good, yeah. So uh, these are just some examples that we've uh, we've seen or we've worked with people. So checking just for understanding in their PowerPoints, having a basic, okay, as you're going, oh, by the way, can you answer this question? And if most people get it wrong, Maybe they don't understand what's going on. The immediate course feedback, uh, any kind of discussion, you can do attendance, participation, making sure people are engaged with what they're doing. Uh, we've done course quizzes using these, brief quizzes. Uh, it's also seen um, entire midterms have been done using clickers as well. I'm not sure about poll everywhere, I know, but I know that uh, clickers, what they did was just as they're going through and on their exam paper, they go through and just, hey, be like that so they can track. So people have done that. It's, uh, it's worked successfully. It's only been a few examples that have done it, but uh, those are some good examples there in class types of things. Um, okay, just moving on. I, yes, Shibu. Quick one. Um, we had a discussion at, at Sports School uh, with, with some instructors who had used tweakers. One of the problems that was uh, reported was um, a student bringing in his friend's clicker uh, to, to mm. uh, give proxy vote. And that became a problem. And you, know, you count 51 bodies, yet there are 54 answers. Mm. Uh, it becomes an issue. And, but it's difficult to then catch who is the culprit and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that's one, one issue. With the, with the other uh, medium, that is the poll everywhere, you know, cell phone, laptop, whatever. 
is that uh, going with the IP address or how, it, it, in other words, I'm thinking of the same problem. Can I have my laptop and give my response and go to another screen and pretend mm -hmm. I'm somebody else as well? I think you can, you can text, but as a Ryan, you're nodding. Do you want to? Yeah. yeah, it depends on how you set it up. You can set it up to be anonymous, or you can set it up so people either have to log in uh, to it so you know who they are. But if one student gives another student the same login, they can bring in somebody else. So, so it's possible. Yeah. So it doesn't uh, track the IP address and see whether the answer is coming from the same source. It, it does track the IP address, but say they have their, their laptop and cell phone. Sorry, I can't get that. So, but you have to, if they're logged in, you, the same login can't get you two answers. So you need to have somebody else's login Correct. that Correct. you've listed as being Correct. part of your class. Correct. All right. So, so you're probably, probably an attendance meter, uh, and it can be used for, for grading things, but you see a lot more people can use it in a more anonymous fashion. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, moving on, we just got a couple minutes, so. I, Wanted to get into this. We let's start. We got into the, the tech heavy stuff, but I wanted to talk more a little bit about so choosing. So things to take into consider. So obviously you need to think about who's going to be assessed. So what are their roles? Are they going to be all uh, undergrad students, master students, or higher level? Depending on the level, you need to think about any subgroups. Maybe you need to hack, take uh, accessibility into consideration. Uh, talking about the technology, I mentioned earlier the ease of use. So if it's going to be something, if there's good, the technology is going to be a barrier, it's going to take away from what you're trying to do rather than actually contributing to that. Uh, and then think about just what your group normally does. Don't try to introduce something, boom, here we're doing this, and it might be beyond the level of what the student does. So you need to take that, like what do they, what's, what's normal, so a slow progression rather than jumping right into doing something. Um, maybe students, sometimes they might, have, might not trust what they're doing with certain technologies. So you really need to consider that. Um, and then there's a model. I have a, actually a handout for that. Um, I'll give it to you in a moment. This is called the sections model. It comes from um, Bates and Poole. They've uh, implemented this model where that this gives you an analysis of how you can choose the technology that's based on your needs. So you can go through this and just try to decide, okay, how does this fit within my situation? Um, it can be all different levels. If you wanted to do it just in your class or if you're a department administrator or a university administrator, you can think of different ideas. So I know this is a big, giant wall of text, and trust me, I played with it trying to see how I could do it. I wanted to, but I wanted to keep it all together. So these are the basic steps. So students, so who are the students? What are their situations? Uh, do we know anything about them? Does the technology help them? Uh, again, the ease of use. So is there a barrier for uh, getting people into it? Think about the teachers, students, who's going to be using it. If it's difficult for the teacher to use and that shows, then the students are probably going to be turned off a little bit too. So make sure that you understand how to use this if you're going to be doing it. Costs, obviously technology costs money. Um, is it overall, is it going to be something that's going to be something that you're buying for the whole class to use and it's going to be a cost to you? Is it going to be a cost to the university? Or is there a per user cost? And in that case, we get into different considerations of what you can require a student to buy in terms of technology, access to certain websites, that kind of thing. So that's a whole, that's, that's another thing that you need to take into consideration. Uh, the instructional needs for teaching and learning. Um, Trust me, if you can't see back there, just I've got a handout here. I'll give it to you in a moment. Um, so what kind of learning does this support? Does this support what you're trying to do, or is it just a bell and whistle, a shiny thing that you're trying to have, implement? The interactivity, does it allow, or is it uh, going to improve some kind of interactivity? Is it improving the content interaction, the way the student's dealing with the content? Is it going to improve the way they deal with their classmates, or is it uh, improving how they deal with you? So think about that. Organizational issues, so some barriers that uh, your institution, Carleton, might have in place. Maybe everybody's, uh, the university decided to adopt one type of technology and you want to try something else, it might not be supported, that idea. Novelty, is it new? Is it version 1.0? If it's a point .0, there's probably a problem with it. Uh, <laughs> so think about, okay, how, 
how far down the progression are there bugs? Are there bugs? Uh, what potential issues could be there because it's a new new tool? And then finally, the speed, and that's not like the speed how fast your internet is. It's how can it be? How quickly can you put it into your course? So if you just have students get a clicker, for example, that's pretty quick. Just get one, go. Not that easy, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but if it, if there's a lot of changes that are required for your class, then that might take more time. So that's something else that you'll need to look at. Um, I've got a couple links here. I have um, this is just the reference. This is a really good model. I will put this handout here. So this is something that you can take back and look, and it's actually just something for you to write down as you're doing something with your class. So this is, it helps your decision making process. Test it out, see how well it works, and it gives you, it gives you the opportunity to go in and look at uh, how effective it's actually been for your course, for your choosing. So I'll set this right here, and as you're leaving, you can come and grab it. Um, EDC staff members, no, please. Yeah. <laughs> I only made enough for people coming here. Um, so that's the main part of what we're talking about today. Uh, the sections model, uh, I've used it a number of times in a number of different situations, and I think it's, it's a really good model for choosing. Obviously, there's not doesn't cover every single idea, but it's a framework. So if you have other things that you want to implement, feel free to have a look at that. So again, I told you there'd be a test. It's easy. Make sure it's easy. Uh, aligns with your goal, your purpose, whatever you're choosing. A, integrate it into your actual course. Don't just have this extra thing. And then always model, make sure that it's students understand how they have to go through and do whatever they're doing. So I really quickly went through that last part. But I hope uh, if you have any questions about uh, the tools that we have, how to choose the right one for yourself, feel free to ask. Or, no? Thank you. All right. Thank you. And that's exactly one hour, so very good. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. And if you are interested, I think there was a sign-up sheet. Did everybody get that going around there? That's over there. Did everybody get that? They made it? OK, good. Um, I'll try. If you're interested in getting into that CU Learn group, uh, class that I was showing you, just the gallery, uh, I'll go and enroll the people that signed on that sheet. Just uh, Some of you are and some of you aren't, so I'll just make sure. So if you are interested, Feel free to go in and have a look. It'll show up on your CU Learn. So. Okay, thank you. <laughs>